We made it to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. So starting out, how do we treat each other? How should you treat the people around you, especially the saints around you? So it says, rebuke not an elder. So don't rebuke an elder. In this case, an older man in the church. Uh, don't rebuke him. That is, give a strong correction to. Don't uh, come at him rebuking him. It says, entreat him. What's the difference? Well, if you entreat him, you calmly, respectfully approach him to show him the way of God more perfectly. Like in Acts 18.26. In Acts 18.26, you got a guy by the name of Apollos. And this guy, it says, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So you see this guy in Acts 8.24, it was a guy named Apollos, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak speak boldly in the synagogue and they took basically just took him aside and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly and it says and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ so you got this guy, Apollos, he's mighty in the scriptures, but he's just off on some things. They didn't come in there saying, you heretic, uh, you don't even need to be teaching the Bible and being mean and all this stuff. They just took him to the side and calmly spoke to him and treated him, and, ex and they showed him the way of God more perfectly. That's not what you see today. If somebody... What you see today is people loudly, meanly rebuking people over things and even doing it to somebody that's much older in the faith, older in age and in the faith. When that person has put in many years in Christian service, many years in the Bible, and you still got these young punks mm, approaching them, Maybe even making videos about them, or giving them a strong rebuke. But this says, and treat him as a father. He may not be your father, but you entreat him like you would your father. So rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. It works both ways, you see that? Don't use your age, don't use your old age as an excuse to disrespect the younger men. You know, mostly you hear respect your elders. Well, respect the men that's younger than you too. Don't use your age as an excuse to make you feel like you can say whatever you want or treat him worse than other people. You treat the younger men as brethren. Look at Proverbs 18.24. If you treat the younger men as brethren... You're going to be treating them pretty close. Proverbs 18, 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Brothers stick close. And if you're treating the younger men as brethren, then you're going to treat them like someone that's close to you that you care about. Look at Proverbs 20 and verse 29. In Proverbs twenty twenty nine, it says, The glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty of old men is the gray head. So you see, if you're a young man, 
The thing about you is you've got a lot of strength, physical strength. But if you're an old man, you got a gray head, and hopefully that gray head has a lot of comes along with a lot of wisdom. But you see a role reversal where it's like the old men, they're trying to show their strength that they don't have anymore, and the young man is trying to show this wisdom that he's never had. So you got the young man telling the old man what to do, and the old man's stuck in the past. He's still trying to show some type of strength that he used to have, trying to outdo the younger man physically, but he's not given any wisdom. He's not. He doesn't have any sound wisdom and advice to give because he's wasted all this time. He's never gotten the word of God, so he can't even give the young man any advice. And the young man, he thinks that he knows everything, and they're weak nowadays because, I guess, so much time playing video games and they're lazy. It's just a role reversal there. The young man thinks he knows everything. The old man still thinks he can, he's got the strength that he used to have. And maybe even thinks he knows a lot when, when he really doesn't because he's never got in the Word of God. So they're all in a mess. But it says the old, the old men, the beauty of the old men is the gray head. Let's look at another verse. In Proverbs 16, 31, it says, The hoary head is a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. So that gray hair, don't be ashamed of it. You know, if you've been found in the way of righteousness, it's a crown of glory. So, and we need to treat each other right. The younger men need to treat the older men right. The older men need to treat the younger men right. They both have their strengths. And then it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 2, the elder women as mothers. So the elder women, you treat them like you would your mother. The elder women is referring to older women. It's not referring to women pastors in that sense of an elder. But you treat the older women with honor. They are someone's mother, even if they're not your mother. Think about that. When you see older women, you imagine them as your mother. That's going to uh, lessen the chance for fornication and adultery there. If you're seeing all these older women around you as your mother, that will lessen the chance of fornication. You're not seeing them as some type of prospect or something. Most likely that's somebody else's wife and someone else's mother. And you wouldn't want somebody flirting with your wife. You wouldn't want somebody treating your mother wrong. So you treat the older women as mothers. Look at Ephesians 6, 2. Ephesians 6 and verse 2. It says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So if you're treating her this older woman as a mother, you're showing her honor. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Then it says in verse 2, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. So if you're treating the younger as sisters, this would also greatly lower the chances of fornication with the younger women. It says the, the younger women as sisters with all purity. You see that? You, if you're seeing all the women that are older as mothers and all the women that are younger as sisters, you're not going to be flirting around with everybody, every woman that comes along. All right, the next verse. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Indeed, basically... In reality, in truth, in fact, one that someone that's really a widow. And if, in case you don't know what a widow is, a widow is a woman who has lost her husband by death. And the Bible even gives instructions on how to treat these widows. It says, honor widows that are widows indeed. 
Look at Acts 6 1. Acts 6 1. It says, In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So this is what they did. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they th thought enough for the widows to call some men out to take care of this business there. So it is a big deal. You're supposed to honor widows that are widows indeed. Ones that are truly widows. And it's going to give the qualifications of, of what type of woman she has to be to get this type of service. It says, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them first, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable unto God. So, if they have young men in their family who can help, you know, let them help first. It says, let them show piety. And piety, that's, you know, reverence to God in this case by relieving their relative widow. So you're showing a good attitude towards God by doing that. Let them first to show piety at home. And to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Requite means to repay. You see, your parents did a lot for you, there's going to come a time when it's time to help them. This is good and acceptable before God. Isn't that something? You can do something that's good and acceptable before God. In 1 Timothy 2.3, remember it said, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. That was in the sense of praying for all men. It was good and acceptable. In the sight of God our Savior. Romans 12, 2. Romans 12 and verse 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's possible to do things that are good and acceptable before God, and that's what we need to be striving to do. Verse 5. Now, that, now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. So to be qualified to get service from the church, for a widow to get service from the church, she needs to be desolate. Desolate, if she's desolate, then she's solitary. She doesn't have anybody. She has to trust in God. Trusteth in God. She's saved. She's faithful. She's living right. It says continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. Meaning she hasn't thrown out the faith in hard times. She's still living for the Lord night and day. A close relationship with God. It says, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. So she hasn't thrown out the faith. She's continuing supplication, supplications, prayers night and day. Supplications, that's, you know, a petition, an earnest request for supplies to the Lord. Prayers. It talks about prayers. This shows she has a close fellowship with God. If she's in it night and day, she's praying without season, like Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. So this isn't just, this can't be just some woman that's lost her husband there's qualifications here for her to get this service from the church and it says she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth if this, if she's living in pleasure then she's not qualified so liveth in pleasure there is pleasure in unrighteousness you can get pleasure in unrighteousness and second thessalonians 2:12 it says 
that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So there is pleasure in it. And a lot of women, they live in pleasure. A lot of men live in pleasure. But they're dead while they live. There's pleasure in sin. Hebrews Look at the book of Hebrews 11.25. It says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So there's pleasure in unrighteousness. There's pleasure in sin. But they only last for a season. And when men love pleasure more than God, that is an attitude of the last days. Look at 2 Timothy 3.4. When you love pleasure more than the things of God, you're in that last day's mindset. 2 Timothy 3, 4. Start, well, let's start in verse 1. 2 Timothy 3, 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. You're in the last day's mindset when you love pleasure more than you love God. Another thing, Titus 3.3, 3. Titus 3 and verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures. You can serve pleasures. So there's pleasure in unrighteousness. There's pleasure in sin. People love pleasures more than they do God. You can serve pleasures. But here it is. You're better off to take pleasure in infirmities. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Says there, Paul says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You're better off to serve God and choose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and take pleasure in infirmities. <clears throat> when a person lives in pleasure, she's dead while she liveth. She's like the living dead. Just like the uh, church in Revelation 3 1. Revelation 3 1 unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. That's the living dead. That's where they got the idea for zombies there. The living dead, dead while she liveth. You see, when you got saved, your flesh is dead. And when you walk in the flesh, you're letting a dead man make your choices. Look at Ephesians 2 and verse 5. Ephesians 2 and verse 5. It says, even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. You see, you were dead in sins, but you got saved, you got quickened together, you were made alive, your inner man is alive and saved, but your flesh is dead. And you need to reckon it to be dead. You need to die daily. Look at Romans 6, 11. Romans 6 and verse 11. It says, Likewise, reckon also yourselves to be dead, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, when you got saved, you're, you were quickened, but your flesh died. So you, it says in Romans 6, 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. You see, 
you don't want to serve a dead man. When you live for the flesh and walk on the flesh, you're serving a dead man. You don't want to be one of the living dead. So she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. So, And then he says in 1 Timothy 5, 7, And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. Blameless doesn't mean perfect, but when you keep things right between you and God in regards to fellowship, you're blameless. And there are people that are blameless in the scriptures. Uh, Paul talks about it in Philippians 3, 6. In Philippians 3, 6, he said, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That doesn't mean he was sinless. That doesn't mean that that he had would, would have ever kept the law perfectly. It just means, you know, when you mess up, you get things right between you and the Lord or between another person, and you're once again considered blameless again. You know, you mess up every day. But you keep things confessed up. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's not for salvation, it's for fellowship. You can be blameless. You don't have to walk around guilty and things like that. So this widow, these widows, they need to be blameless. These things give in charge that they may be blameless. And give in charge. That means to instruct authoritatively. And it's not it's not out of the way to be stern either. It's to give in charge, instruct authoritatively. And he's saying this to Timothy, the pastor. So it's not out of the way for the pastor to be stern. It says in verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, Especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You see, even evil men, evil lost men, will take care of their family, generally, as a general rule. And if he don't take care of his own house, any of his family, emphasis on the widows here in the context, then he's denied the faith. He's worse than an infidel. An infidel is an unbeliever. If a man won't even provide for his own, especially for those of his own house, he's denied the faith. Faith. He's worse than an infidel. He's worse than an unbeliever. Because as a gen general rule, even unbelievers will get up and go to work and take care of their family. At least they had in years past. Now they won't hit a lick at a snake. But if you won't even get up and work to provide for your family, you're worse than than a lost person. You're like a lost person. But we'll go ahead and stop there and continue in, probably continue back in verse 8 again next time.